Hey folks, how's it going? As usual, this podcast is sponsored by Alpha Fitness. Alpha Fitness is a personal training company based in Perth, Scotland. But if you do not live in the Perth or don't want to travel to the Perth, because I know we've got listeners all around the world, you can get personal uh, training plans, uh, nutrition plans, and also just uh, general motivation by following Alpha Fitness at the various social media places. Those would be Facebook, follow the Buff Geek on Instagram and follow on the YouTubes on basically everything. I think I'll probably make a list and be able to list everything exactly and succinctly, which is the word of the podcast for the last week, if you've been uh, paying attention to the last couple of episodes. Um, If you would like to check out all of our content, um, which would include... Uh, theories on Game of Thrones and some rants from David about <laughs> about the DCEU, which is not the DCEU now, or check out some of Stu's stats. Stu, I just got your message there on the Facebooks, which is at the Buff Geek uh, page. Um, I will get back to you with my re-revised, revised score in time for publishing those. So, uh, And I want to, th- again, thank you for... Uh, the contributions that you you make because um there's some really nice stats there some really nice stuff so uh, thank you Stu um but as I said you will find us you being the people listening right now including Stu um but also Stu will find us at the Buff Geek Podcast Blog dot WordPress dot com that's our website and um, there is a section there for Alpha Fitness that is the main sponsor of the Buff Geek Show and I think that's about all we have time for now uh, today we're going to be talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer and it's going to be season three just uh, a little heads up I have had the cold so hopefully it will not transfer to you via the airwaves um, which is a really old term and sometimes I catch myself saying things and I realize that I am hurtling towards 40 closer than I'd like to be but I'm guessing that if some of your are listening to this right now and you're big Buffy fans and you might be in the the early 30s range um, so yeah apologies if I sniffle and uh, <clears throat> have to clear my throat a lot and uh, someone did just start playing the bagpipes I get sick of saying I'm sorry about the noise pollution I'm sure you're sick of me saying it also but it happens it usually comes out in post in fact I don't think I've ever, ever heard it um, but this comes with having Alpha Tower situated in the centre of the bustling city known as Perth in the Scotland. So without further ado, we'll move on to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Season 3, probably Part 1. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's the Buff Geek here, and I just sat back from that mic there to make sure that I didn't blow your eardrums off, and hopefully it sounded good. As uh, that lovely <coughs> voiceover person who was just on said, we're going to be tackling Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 3. Now, just a little something to uh, to drop into y'all. I am, um, in my arrogance, I decided that, you know what, I won't take notes for Season 3. No, I won't, because I'm just that darn good. Um, and if I was just that damn good, which ni- late 90s wrestler would I be? No, I-, I decided not to take any notes, and then I realised about three quarters of the way in um, that this was never going to work and that I was going to get really lost and it wasn't going to be as good as what I thought it could be. So with that in mind I went back and decided to not re-watch the episodes but I was looking for someone that was reviewing them. So I was checking out some of the reviews and um, there's a whole bunch of reviewers online for everything, as you probably know, but there's a chap that I've been following who is making some amazing content. Um, he is at The Passion of the Nerd on the YouTubes. He covers all the Buffy episodes up to, I think, season four, episode four or five, which is actually, strangely enough, where I'm at um, currently, and then I stopped watching season four because I, I, I didn't want to get too confused. I wanted to stay within season three for a little while, so... I've held back on my my desires to make sure I put out a better product for you guys. Hopefully, I manage it. Um, that's because I love y'all. Um, he's also called TPN's Buffy Guide. You can probably type that in and you'll find him. But Passion of the Nerd, uh, I'd like you to hit him up. Um, you can check out 
It's, it, he's got a lot of, it's like 10 minute videos per episode, really nicely done. He's obviously much better at editing than me in terms of um, making a visual piece. Um, maybe it's just, maybe he's just got better software, I don't know. But uh, he's got some very insightful uh, points to make. I don't agree with everything he says, but that's fine. It's kind of like having a conversation with someone else, it's, it's, it, which is probably why you're listening to this. You know, you're kind of, you won't agree with everything that I say. Um, but, you know, he's got, a, he's got a nice voice, a nice uh, looking product and um, some really good points. He's also done some uh, some reading and there's some books I'm going to mention that he's mentioned, which I think I want to get and delve deeper into the Buffyverse. And he's raised some interesting points to me or fleshed out some things where I've thought, oh, right. He's obviously a very smart man because a couple of things he, he throws out there, I'm like, oh, yeah, I never thought about, about that. Usually in reference to little things like when Angel's reading a book, what the book actually means to the episode. So, you know, he's he's a smart guy, and I want to take my hat off to him, metaphorically speaking. And uh, if you do go for him, let him know that you found him through uh, the Buff Geek podcast. That'd be really nice. And uh, maybe at some point we could... Um, me and him could have a chat about something. I would really like that because um, this stuff's really, really good. Anyway, so I'm going to be using um, Wikipedia as my kind of what sort I'm looking for here. Just to keep me on track with all the episodes and I've also got a ton of notes so hopefully I'll be able to make this make some sort of sense of what I've written and what is on Wikipedia. <clears throat> so we just left season two and for those of you who maybe didn't watch it and just kind of come on to this episode either by one of those um, those random kind of just continuous play options. Sip of coffee for the working man. <clears throat> oh, dearie me. That cold is not going away. Um, yeah, basically, in season two, spoilers, <coughs> Angel turns evil um, due to shooting his load inside Buffy, which is ultimate happiness, I suppose, and in a very teenager-esque way, and maybe not in, so, in also so many ways, um, finally getting that girl or having sex with that person, conquering her, if you will, and maybe for girls it's the same way, means a lot, and it might be the the ultimate payoff um, to what you need and what you want, you know? So, it's, I mean, Angel is kind of a teenager as well in the show. Um, he's never really grown up from being Liam. He has a little bit, but it's all based on restraint. It's not really, he's not managed to, to progress himself, he just doesn't do things. Um, whereas, as Angelus, he was free to do whatever he wanted. So, you, well, we must remember that although Angel's lived for a very long time, he is he is static. And many people go through this, especially people who... Uh, maybe I shouldn't get into this tangent, but people people can become stuck. Uh, a prisoner of, of a situation that happened to them, or, or an idea, or whatever, and it just seems like they don't ever quite move on. Which, life is meant to be some sort of journey. And you're meant to have these parts of it and these rites of passage, so to speak, and evolve. And it becomes even more apparent to me as I get older. And I just trained a, a young chap by the name of Duncan for most of this year to get him uh, to get him to put on ten kilos of weight to get into the military. Uh, the, well, actually, the Navy is going to be doing uh, civil engineering, but he needed to put on ten kilos. He was very underweight and his, his strength wasn't really that good. But even civil civil, engineer, blah, 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 civil engineers need to be, uh, you know, strong and of, of certain standard physically. So he's just completed uh, completed his training with me and, and left just a couple of weeks ago because he's going to do the. the they go away for X, like, uh, like three, four days, and then they come back for about two weeks and then they find out when they're going to go away again and that's when they start kind of their three month uh, run then back for a little while and then off again and basically he's, he's starting his new job so um but training someone who's who's 18 and maybe some of the some of the uh, other young lads have trained and young girls have trained you see as much as Duncan is a mature young man also 
I could see some of the youthful things that reminded me of me and, um, and not to say that he's arrogant, but the arrogance of youth um, and the belief that they know everything. And I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm a experienced sort of chap, but then someone who's 40, 45, maybe I know shit, you know? So uh, it's an interesting perspective. And Angel doesn't really get that. Um, he's he's not really moved forward. He's kind of, well, this is what I used to do when I was Liam, so I can't do that anymore, the whoring and the drinking and the no responsibility. I can't do the Angelus thing anymore because that makes me a, well, a killer and I've got a soul and that's tough. I mean, he could kill, but he, I mean, he's got a soul now and presumably, well, apparently if you're a good person, um, you can do that. Um in a way, which kind of raised some questions about some of the other characters in the show later on. But we'll get to that. Um, so he's kind of like, well, what do I do? I'm going to focus on just saving the world. And he's got a mission, but he's not really growing as a person. So he gets a chance to grow as a person, sort of, an, um, an angel. But in also another way, the vampires don't grow as people, which is why they can kind of stay the same. One of the people that, one of the vampires that do grow as a person exponentially so which is why he becomes my favourite character of the show and so so interesting <clears throat> is someone we'll be introduced to in about four episodes time I think five episodes time Um, again no 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 no. he, he comes back in eight episodes time and that's, that's Spike <clears throat> reintroduced to I should say um, so that's what makes him so interesting because he goes through a whole a very big emotional arc. Anyway, let's get to the first episode. So Buffy ran away after killing Angel, and Angel, Angelus had become Angel again just prior to her killing him, and she'd left, and she's been away the whole summer after her mother told her not, uh, if she leaves the house, to not think about coming back. So, basically, uh, Joyce, 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 Joyce. No, no, we'll get to that. So what's really nice, and this is something that I didn't pick up, but I knew I liked it, but I didn't know the reason why, and this is um, something I want to thank the uh, uh, Passion of the Nerd for, because sometimes he'll say, this scene here is blah, 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 or this is the name of something, and I'll be like, oh, right, okay, that's what it is. So this is one I definitely want to dedicate to him, but there's a long shot at the start of this episode where you meet the, 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 the Scooby gang. So Willow's talking to Oz, and Oz tells... Um, Willow that he didn't graduate so that's why Oz is there and then you move and it's just a one continuous shot and then Xander meets Cordy and he'd been talking about Cordy previously and they act all sort of weird and and it, it kind of goes through the snaking kind of bustling environment of the school the um, uh, Larry, Larry who's now gay but hiding it in the football team, he um, he's saying we're going to kick these guys asses this year as long as no one dies on the team yeah and there's just so much stuff happening in the school so much so busy 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 then you get the contrasting shot of Buffy sitting alone in this drab dingy apartment with like a can of beans or something and you're like oh this sucks um and obviously previous to that you see the the dream sequence where Buffy is with Angel on on the beach outside and you're kind of like wait did I miss Something? Did something happen? Wait. Oh, dream sequence. And she's in, in LA. You know, a bad part of LA. So, you know, Buffy's working in a diner there. Um, And, you know, occasionally guys are spanking her in the ass and calling her sweet cheeks or whatever. You can imagine this sort of stuff. And she's just got to keep her mouth shut. Which is horrible to see. And I, for how much I dislike that kind of stuff. And you just don't get used to it in Buffy. Because she, you know, punches guys in the face and doesn't take any shit. But it's even worse when, when it happens in Buffy because you're so used to it not happening. And this will matter more in one of the episodes later. It just, just oh, it's just so fucking creepy and horrible. It's disgusting. Um, and I, I used to manage a bar. Even when I just worked, tended bar, I would, um, I would ask guys to leave if they spat one of the waitresses on the ass or did something like that. They were told they had to go straight away um, and if they were getting a little bit funny with the waiters prior to that like kind of trying to grab their hand or whatever get them to stay and talk longer they would they would get a stern warning I did not want any of that in my place cause no one should have to put up with that you know um, and yeah it kind of meant that sometimes there was more arguments than 
I mean, I could have just left it and it's just a part of the work environment, but I don't believe that that's right. So I would have an argument with someone and sometimes, sometimes I'd have to throw them out um, because they would take it take it badly. But, you know, when you're being a dick and trying to touch up someone, which is effect, effectively what it is, I would never spank a girl in the ass in that way, especially not when she's working. Like, maybe if you're... If you're if you're out and you're all friends and whatever and there's a laugh and a joke and there's sometimes it's 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 okay and sometimes it's definitely definitely not. But when the girl's just trying to do her job and then feeling her ass, it's just not cool, you know. Um, and I would throw out whole groups of guys because they would try and do it hidden. Anyway, I'm going on a tangent there. It's wrong and it feels disgusting. The guy with the tash, the trucker cap, spanking Buffy. Oh, it's horrible. Anyway, she ends up bumping into this um this couple and um. The girl's uh, name is Lily. Um, I can't remember if that's her name from season two. She was the girl that was in the episode with... Uh, oh, this is going to be shit. I can't remember the name of the episode. Didn't write it down. I suck. She was in the episode where Buffy's friend um, turns out to have brain cancer and he tries to sacrifice all these vampire worshippers to Spike, and etc. Et if you're listening to this, you'll know who I'm talking about and you'll know the episode. I can't, remember, can't believe I've forgotten the name. I want to say his name was Scott. No, that's not right. Anyway, um, so Lily is sitting there with her boyfriend. They've got the matching tattoos, and they're, they're that's all they, that's all the money they've got, and they're obviously being irresponsible and such. And it's tough for for Buffy to watch, um, and basically, um, it, Lily is kind of a, a metaphor or a parallel of Buffy in this episode, where she loses her partner and is lost and so is Buffy. Um I mean her partner dies. Buffy uh, tracks her partner down who seems to have aged to the year of about eighty or more. Uh, the only reason she knows who he is is because of this tattoo, which is um which is very handy of course. And and Buffy's kinda of wandering the streets of LA and um bumps into this kinda of evangelist type character, this this really sickening nice polite man who is obviously trying to get um teenagers to come and you know see the light and you know be pure and get them off the streets or at least that's a pretense um it turns out that he is a, a hell demon and he's capturing these young people and taking them to hell or quote unquote hell because he describes hell as what is hell but the absence of hope so it, is it the hell no but it is a hell and it is that person's hell so that's quite interesting, and it's hinted at that maybe that's the same hell that Angel went to, in at some different point in this show. But I don't think it is actually. I think uh, Angel went to a different hell, um, but it would make sense because he never aged, of course, whether other workers age, but it would change him exponentially. Um, so that's interesting to wonder if he actually went to that hell and was maybe there, and and managed to escape because of the uprising that Buffy started, potentially, theory, I don't know, what do you folks think, want to know what you think, excuse me, so, um, oh, I keep losing my, my phone keeps doing this thing, losing my, my bit, so basically, Buffy ends up finding herself within this prison, she's asked by one of the guards there, who are you, and you're meant to say no one, or you catch a beating, and Buffy, who has been calling herself Anne, as her secret code name, and that is the name of the episode, um, has kind of said that she wants to be left alone, and, and, and how she bumped into Lily is because Lily saw her again looking for her boyfriend, and Buffy wouldn't respond to Anne, as people do in TV shows, and then when she says Buffy, she stops and responds. And that happens in Sleeping with the Enemy and uh, several other films and TV shows. And you're like, how would you not remember to respond to your fake-ass name? Is that not a real priority for you? WTF. Anyway, as Buffy says, you know, I'm Buffy and you are. And gives her a little smile and basically just kicks some ass. And then this hell guy grabs Lily and says, you know, you'd all belong to me. You're nobody's yada yada bad guy speak but when he's not paying attention paying attention lily pushes him off of a ledge and he dies and buffy gets everyone out of the hell dimension at least everyone that's there and this is one of the problems with, with buffy and some tv shows uh, in the fact that 
sometimes they try and do something that requires a bigger budget so it doesn't look some of it looks really good and like the steel works and everything but when there's like 15 people escaping it doesn't look like hundreds of people so it would probably look better if there was loads of people but game of thrones suffers from it from from time to time various shows do so that kind of kind of spells it a little bit but i kind of think of buffy like you the theater that you don't go that you don't always go to the theater and go well they're shouting in this weird way and facing me as opposed to facing each other that's weird i'm not into the you know subject matter so i think if you're more akin to the theater then you can probably get into a show like that like there's some it's like watching old movies sometimes the specials or the way it's filmed is kind of not naturalistic or the special effects aren't very really good so you know it, it works uh i suppose it depends how much you can suspend your disbelief in what you're watching it for so that i mean this this is something that buffy occasionally suffers from where you've got kind of a a bit in the show and it looks a little bit cheap or whatever especially in the first season and some of the second season and i just it would be nice if they had a bit more extras there but you know they did some good stuff with the la um filming and that all worked really well so you know potato potato um basically buffy frees everyone and realizes she is buffy she is the slayer and it's time to go home and face up to her um her life her choices what's happened you know by hiding out She's just got herself in this kind of stuck point where she, all she does is think about what, what happened to Angel and you know what 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 else could um what else could be um and the possibilities of that as opposed to moving forward. So I suppose she's looking for and I want to say catharsis, um, and this happens to so many people when something tragic happens. They just get stuck like a record player and going round and round and round and round and round. And round. And maybe in, in, even in some cases, if someone passes away, it's, you think it's noble to, to grieve for them for a really long period of time, but they wouldn't want you to be stuck. So if you are someone out there who's listening to this and you're having a hard time with it, um, I would suggest that it's time for you to move forward because that is what life is about. It's about the journey. I mean, if you imagine you're going from point A to point Z, that's your lifespan and you stop at J and you just stay circling J and all you know is to look back to the previous letters and wonder what the future ones could be but you could move forward move forward and I suppose that's also works for prison if you go to prison for whatever reason um, then you are basically put on a, a stasis if you will and part of human life is to move forward and, and grow so you're not growing you're not going to I mean you can grow not grow in prison you could not grow in life or you could grow where you're where you're there you know you could grow anywhere so I suppose my point is that you should always try and grow as a person and move forward and don't think about don't let yourself be stuck in your current predicament one thing that kind of annoyed me in this episode was Joyce because Giles has also been, not obviously, but Giles has been touring the country looking for Buffy. And then he goes to see Joyce and say, oh, it's another dead end. And he says, you shouldn't blame yourself. And Joyce says, I don't blame myself. I blame you. And as much as Giles told Buffy to keep the secret from her mother, um, I don't think that that's fair at all. She said... If you leave this house, don't think about coming back. So, what's Buffy's going to take that literally. You know, teenagers do take these things literally. And some people always take things like that literally. As opposed to thinking, well, that was something I was said in the heat of the moment. I've said some, some awful things to people. And I, I've wanted to hurt them. So I've went for the killing blow to upset them in an argument. And to win the argument. Um... And I was told once by someone that you need to be careful with what you say to people because there's some things you say and you can't take back. And it is kind of true. But also, on the same token, you need to understand that sometimes everything isn't so literal and final. Because everyone said, I'm here's one. I'm sure you've all said, I'm not going to drink again. Well, guess what? You probably did. <laughs> but at the time, you really felt like you weren't going to. But you forget. You know? We forget. So I think Joyce, Joyce is a little bit of a dick here. Um, 
Buffy going to literal prison is uh, is a visual representation of of things. It's it's you know she is in her own prison anyway. So actually going to someone else's prison and being forced to do manual labor is what helps shake her out of it. Actually, if he'd left her, she might have stayed in her own hell for much longer. This guy was used again in an episode of Angel. I didn't like him in this. Didn't like the villain in this. Um, I never have. Um, but I thought he was too hokey. He, he almost got. I know what he was trying to do, but he didn't quite get it. However, someone else that does the really does this style of comedy and creepiness. I don't know what to call it. Is the mayor, and he does it perfectly. This guy was brought back for an episode of Angel, I think. It was definitely season one, I think, like episode like seven or eight or whatever. <coughs> and I'll probably do an Angel review once I've done with the Buffy one, because because why not, you know? Why not? Um, this will be the last um, rating of the viewers. The US viewers in millions was 7.1 for this episode. The rest of the listing on um, Wikipedia is, is, is NA, so I don't know why that is, but it is not available. And I've realized we've done one episode of 26 minutes in, and as usual, I am taking my sweet time. But um, if you listen to this, you probably know I like to go long form, and we're going to go long form. Maybe I should make individual episodes, I don't know. Maybe I'll go through it again next year and do individual episodes. you got to let me know if you want it. I need to know what you want. Okay, episode two, and number overall, it's 36 in the series. Um, is Dead Man's Party. Uh, this is the one where Buffy comes home, goes to see her friends, um, everyone's acting a bit weird and not talking about the matter at hand. Joyce has some demon mask which ends up being put on by her friend and she becomes the monster of the week and they have to kill her. Um, and in between there's a the, the Scooby gang throw a big party for Buffy in the hope that they want to illustrate, they want to demonstrate, sorry, how much they miss her and care for her, but they don't actually want to talk about the issues. So, that's what we got there. That aired on October 6, 1998. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, things I've noticed in the episode. Buffy and Joyce are forcing this normalness where Buffy's like, so I'm going to go out. Okay, I'm going slaying. Mm, only if they give me lip. Ha <laughs> ha Okay, well... Have you tried not being the Slayer? You know, like, Joyce is trying to be pretty cool about it. It's almost like they make a lot of references to the Slayer where Joyce approaches it like Buffy's come out as gay. And in the late 90s, that was a bigger thing than it probably is now. Or at least it was it was used as a, a storyline. You know, like, someone being gay would be a whole storyline about this one person. Now, in TV, as far as I know, someone being gay... Well, it's just, they're gay, you know, whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's probably the right way to do it, really. Uh, unless the story is about them being straight and then becoming gay and trying to consolidate with that. Which, I mean, like I said, there was a lot of stories about that back then. But maybe this is the late 90s version of me talking. I don't know. I always thought it was quite interesting going through the, the dynamic of it. Um, but also, in a certain way, some studios would have been using it as a cheap way to be quote-unquote controversial or topical or modern. So it depends how it's done. But Joyce kind of talks about the Slayer as if Buffy's came out as being gay. Can you not? Can you maybe try not being gay? I think people have heard that before. Um, oh, sorry, I'm starting to feel a little bit a little bit crapper again. Whew. So, Buffy and Joyce are acting weird, and what's been happening with the Scooby Gang is they've been basically taking up the mantle of Buffy and hunting vampires reasonably unsuccessfully. There is a there is a part in the episode where the gang are hunting a vampire, and Buffy Buffy saves Xander from getting his ass kicked, and the look Xander gives her is unbelievable he is frozen he's like what the fuck is happening here um so it's so powerful and it says so much um just absolutely frozen 
And then Buffy makes some joke about slaying, saying it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. And of course, just cover your ears for like 10 seconds, 30 seconds, no, 10 seconds. Xander loses an eye in season 7 and then becomes an even more of a serious character and loses his boyish kind of youthful silliness. <coughs> so, that's very interesting that Buffy says that. Very interesting indeed. You know what, if I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to... It's You've all watched the seasons, I hope, so... If you've not, maybe just come back in like a minute again. I wonder if someone literally said, what if we take Xander's eye? Like, he's always been the funny one, and he's always, he's been her heart, and he's always kept things really light. At certain points, he also gets to do, like, the really deep and meaningful, meaningful, blah. Sorry, it's the cold talking, but it was so blah. Meaningful conversations, you know, the sobering ones that he gives Buffy in pep talks. What if he actually loses an eye, and it's no more fun in games? We'll just straight up use it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I forget that Xander loses an eye, and now that I think about it, that's fucking shit. God damn. Anyway, so Buffy ends up kind of throwing Xander and the rest of the group and Nighthawk and the rest of them. And by the way, a few things I noticed. Oz has got like a fucking walkie-talkie duct tape to his shirt or some shit. That's hilarious. And Cordelia wearing like a Buffy-esque outfit. She basically went in and decided to dress. How would a, how would Buffy dress? Like a, like the Vampire Slayer kind of a bit camo. Uh, she looks really hot. Oh, dear. <sighs> anyway, so... The gang are all kind of like, oh shit, Buffy's back, what are we doing? Um, and they say we should go see Giles, and she's very nervous to see Giles, and when she knocks on the door, on the door Giles has genuine, he's genuinely happy that she's back. And Giles actually gets, Giles understands what Buffy's going through, because he's went through magical issues, he's lost a loved one, he's, you know, Giles understands better than most well, certainly all the Scooby gang and Joyce. So, yeah. He says, welcome back, Buffy. And he's the only one to do that. And he gets them all in for some tea, which I don't even think they have the tea. I think they just eat the biscuits. And he gets a little bit upset in the in the kitchen and it, listening to his family talking. And this is, this is why it gets very hard for me to even like season four. There's something nice about them all being at school and Giles looking after them. And I suppose... Maybe that's where I am in my life. And I still want to be a teenager in some respects with less responsibilities. And so I'm more, I'm getting closer to being Giles. I mean, I'm older than the cast were when season seven's finished. <coughs> so it's very interesting for me to be rewatching this and kind of feeling like I've, I've, I'm closer to Giles's age than Buffy's. Well, she's 16 though, so it's okay. Um... It's just, uh, it's interesting how it changes, yet the show's still amazing. You can identify more. I always thought Giles was cool, but now I'm starting to identify even more with him. Uh, and I dare say in another ten years I will fully identify with him, and maybe there'll be someone in my life that mirrors their youth. I don't know. I'm sure you guys are guys and girls are feeling the same. I say guys as a term for everyone, by the way. It's just, you know, I'm not dismissing women. It's just Guys is a word for guys and girls. It's just how it is with me. Um, so when they're sitting there chilling, Oz deadpans a, you're not wanted for murder anymore. So that's cool. Um, that was a good way just to cover like cover that from season two and the whole Kendra thing, Kendra dying and, and whatever. Just, just get that right out of the way. They don't need you for murder. Um, so yay. Um, and like I said, the gang decided to throw this party and Joyce, it, Joyce decides to go with it. Originally, she wants to get the good china out, which would have made more sense, but that would mean they'd have to all talk, so let's just fill the room with as many people as possible. And I like this episode, and I don't like this episode, because some of the episodes are a little bit Monster of the Week, and there's a little bit too much Monster of the Week for me here, but then there's lots of good quality acting, and there's some progression in the characters and such, and every episode of Buffy I, I love in a certain way. So, they have this big party and Buffy just feels like no one really cares that she's back like I don't recognize any of these people and you know, actually some of the the regulars that you would see at school aren't even there 
just like randoms. And and Joyce's friend comes round and they have a little drink and um in that in, in amongst all this arranging of the party, there is a, a cat that is dead and comes back to life. We know it's by the mask. So a lot of this episode is we know stuff that the cast the characters don't know, which is happens sometimes and is not good because it's all. It's better if something's revealed to everyone at the same time, as opposed to we're in the know and you don't know. So we're just kind of watching someone figure it out, and it's not always. Sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad, and maybe that's why the episode isn't as good for me. I'm not sure, but Giles is basically working on why did this cat come back to life, and then he figures out the mask thing, and then all the the, the monster of the week is people who are dead come back to life and try and get the mask so they can, you know, become godly powered. So, the, <sighs> Joyce's friend dies, gets the mask, and she becomes the godly power, and then Buffy kills her by stabbing her in the eyes. And I think the power is, well, Giles says something about the power being the eyes. She stabs her in the eyes with a, the shovel, and bada bing, bada boom, and everyone's friends again. But before that, the main parts, the main story to tell is that everyone kind of has a go at Buffy, and, and Buffy overhears. <clears throat> I've skipped ahead a little bit. Buffy overhears Willow. Uh, sorry, Buffy overhears Joyce and uh, Joyce's friend talking and Joyce kind of says, oh, it's maybe worse that she's back, but it's out of context and then Buffy wants to leave. Willow catches her and Buffy tells her that she won't understand even though Willie, Willow says, talk to me. Now, from Buffy's perspective, Willow said, go kick Angel's ass, which is obviously a Xander lie. But um, Willow doesn't know that, so Willow's like, why is Buffy being a dick and trying to run away? I'm trying to help her and she won't take it. But Buffy's like, well, you said to kill my boyfriend and don't you have a bit of compassion and sympathy for him, for me because I loved him and he was the first and etc, etc. So, that's the problem we've got. And then Joyce find out, finds out that Buffy's trying to leave and Joyce lays into her big style in front of everyone. And obviously, it was weird that they had the party, but I suppose Joyce tried to let Buffy have this party because she thought that's what she wanted and thought that was the best way to deal with it because she was maybe walking, egg, walking on eggshells a little bit so Buffy doesn't take off again. Xander gets very angry and really lays into Buffy because sometimes Xander's, Xander's got a lot of anger um, in him, and sometimes he just lays it, lays it down, and it's pretty harsh. So, he does so, and um, then it gets broken up by the monsters coming in and looking for the mask, and really, it doesn't quite get resolved, so they just all kind of pick on Buffy. Now, it's pretty cool that Oz steps in there and says he's going to be the referee guy, but everyone really gives it to Buffy very tight. Excuse me, drink of water. <coughs> And I feel very sorry for Buffy in this. And everyone gets to air their grievances, but Buffy just gets attacked. And it's really a shame. And that's what that annoys me. And I kind of just think, do you know what? If Giles was there, this wouldn't have happened. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not. Uh, I like the episode fine, but it's not one of my favourite episodes. And when I'm going back watching them all, um, I don't. Uh, this is probably one that I skip more often than not. If I'm, unless I'm doing a, what sort of, I'm sorry, I'm trying to type something in here at the same time because I'm a multitasking machine. Um, this is one I would skip because some of the, it's just not one that I I love love unless I'm, I'm watching everything all the way through, which I pretty much always do anyway. Um. I find Joyce's friend really annoying uh, in in the proper way, but I still find her really, really, really annoying. Um, I don't know if anyone else finds her annoying. What is cool at the end of this episode is that Giles goes to Snyder and says to him, "Listen, you know we can talk to the you can talk to the board, and um, I'm sure they'll let Buffy and you can't stop her from having edu an education, etc., etc." Snyder's like, "Well, you know what? Um, I can because fuck you." And then Giles just fucking grabs him and throws him up against the wall and says, maybe I should persuade you to let her back in. You're like, oh, that's interesting. So 
at the time I just thought that's how much um, Giles cares for Buffy. I didn't think it was hinting at Giles being dangerous in the past. But he also hot wires the car in this episode and says something about it's right like riding a bloody bicycle and his accent kind of changes a little bit to being less posh and more common, if you will. So, and obviously Giles' accent and like, for example, Buffy's mother originally, everyone was more kind of well, stereotypically dressed up or spoke in a more stereotypical way. The master spoke in a more stereotypical way. He was more of your stereotype a villainous vampire. I mean, he looked like the Nosferatu. And Giles was very, very stuffied up with like, the suit and the whole thing. And, and Joyce, who is probably, I don't know at this time, mid-30s, it was made to have like shorter hair and very momsy. And she's actually becomes more attractive in this series which is probably because she was hitting the gym um, for band candy later on um, yeah this is a really cool scene and I just love me some Giles and they were going to do a Giles show called Ripper and they just never did it and I think it would have worked really really well um, even if they did it now and just did like what is Giles up to you know and kind of kept it loosely in the same universe I would watch the show of that Anyway, this episode pisses me off because I don't think Buffy should be taking that crap and at the end her and Willow, Willow's like, you know, you should take this from us and Buffy's like, okay, and she just kind of just shoulders that responsibility and I, I just like that because they don't know what she's got to do and what she's, like, realistically, any of them can walk away at any time. Any time. Even Giles. She can. You know, so she takes a break and they come down hard on her for it. Maybe she, she should have done it in a different way, but she's 16. Let us sink in for a second here. She's 16. Anyway, we're going to move on to episode 3. <coughs> so, this episode, this episode is called Faith, Hope and Trick. I'm running over my words a little bit because I've suddenly got really stuffed up again. You know, sometimes you've got a cold and then it goes away and you're like, oh, I feel great. And then you're like, oh, I'm stuffed up again. Oh, my throat's sore. Oh, I feel great. Well, now I've got stuffy again. So I uh, apologize for the marble mouthness of myself. But this episode, I didn't realize it was really cleverly named Faith, Hope and Trick. Now, I got that Faith being Faith and Trick being Mr. Trick, but I never realized that Hope was meant to be Scott Hope. His last name is Hope, and he is meant to be the hope of her. Uh, you know, there's hope after Angel. He represents that. It's not to say that he's the best choice or she's the cho he's the choice that she wants. But you know what? There's other guys out there, and he's a pretty decent guy. As all things go, he's quite good looking. You know, whatever he pursues her, so he's obviously he's obviously interested. Excuse me. <clears throat> um. It means that Buffy isn't just a freak. Sometimes she says, am I just a weirdo or whatever. Um, so yeah, this is it's a really clever, uh, cleverly named episode. Even more so than I originally thought. And that's thanks to the Passion of the Nerd again. So, um, in this episode, uh, Faith arrives in Sunnydale. Um, she's being tracked by two vampires. One being Mr. Trick. One being Coquistos. Caquistos, sorry. Um who's kind of like the master vampire of another area and his hands and feet are cloven and he looks more like a... Well, you know what that looks like. Anyway, and also Scott Hope is introduced and he's kind of this guy that's... He's a nice kid, he studies and he's sensitive, but he's smart and he's also good looking and he's interested in Buffy and he kind of pursues Buffy a little bit. So that's kind of the outlay of the story. It turns out that Faith has been running away from these two vampires because they actually killed her watcher. Not they didn't. Um, the what her watcher is not at the watcher retreat, which Giles never seems to get to go to. Um, no, they killed her watcher, and uh, Faith is running scared from them. When it comes time to fight Kakistos, she freezes and is terrified, even though she puts on that hard exterior until Buffy kind of snaps her out of it, and they both kill Kakistos. In this time, Buffy decides to go out with Scott Hope eventually um, because he, it must have been the fact that he offered her to go to, what was it now? Oh, maybe it's in another episode where he offers her to go to see this show, which I thought was hilarious. Um, 
and someone makes a return. So let's get into some of the some of my points that I've written here that go a little bit deeper. So, oh well, straight off the bat, I've written Faith is young and sexy. <laughs> oh, huh. I've written here that only Buffy and Xander. Ra- oh yes, 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 yes. Of course. So when oh no, Faith is not young and sexy. I mean, she is, but she once they meet her at the bronze after she kills some vampire. And they're like, oh, you're the Vampire Slayer. The other one. Cool. Who replaces Kendra? Why does Giles not know about this? Uh, it was in a memo that he didn't get. Something like that. Which is, again, it's, it's kind of weird. The Watcher's Council sounds like they fucking suck, really. Not very organised. Not very good. Um, you couldn't get away with that now. But I suppose it's convenient and it's kind of... I suppose it's joking at the ineptitude of the council because that happens quite often where they're they maybe so organised and so proper and so fantastic and they just screw up a whole bunch and forget like really obvious little details like oh there's a new watcher being called like didn't Giles ever think of that but I suppose in the same token Buffy died and Kendra was called and Buffy came back to life so with Buffy being around Kendra was meant to be an anomaly not the new Slayer. So technically, because Kendra died and uh, Faith is called, <coughs> that means that Kendra is actually the real Slayer. And then Buffy, and then Faith is the real Vampire Slayer and Buffy is not. Because when Buffy <coughs> dies later on in Season 5, there's not another Slayer called to my knowledge. I don't think there is. So, with that in mind, um, I suppose you can forgive Giles or the council for not, well, Giles for not knowing this, and then maybe the council didn't tell Giles because they seem to dick Giles around a whole bunch, I think. I think they gave Giles the job because he's so good, but also he's a free thinker, so they, they try not to include him, include him in it. Wow. Include him in everything. And I presume... Oh, this is my this is my get out for the show that they are hoping to replace Buffy with Faith, and that that Watcher probably told the line more, and that's why they didn't tell Giles straight away. And Faith could only have been the Slayer for three months, four months. Uh, and they maybe only found her like a month previous, so that might a, a week previous even maybe her first fight was with. Mr. Trick and Kakisto is her first big fight. So, you know, maybe I could just cover it like that and we'll just assume it's that way. And thank you, Joss Whedon. You're welcome. Um, so, yeah, Faith makes some joke about um, if I knew that um, all Watchers were this young and sexy. I think, she's, did she say sexy or handsome? I don't know, but she's describing Giles. And Giles says, well, uh, you know, Giles takes it in a very Giles way. Well, if you're disregarding my youth and beauty let's move on it's just so gracious he's just the best um buffy says something like anyone else want to raise their hand if they think you and buffy and xander raise their hand and willow just sits looking at giles like hmm giles and she always did have a crush on giles in fact i think she even says it in season six when she's fighting him so that was a pretty cool thing um mr trick is fantastic great charisma i can't believe he didn't last longer in the series he's such a fun um character he manages to blend the old and the new together in almost a better way than spike like it kind of i mean were they stunt casting it by getting a black vampire to be like hip and you know, because rap was very popular in the 90s and it seemed like um, occasionally studios would exploit certain things and they'd go, well, let's get a black character here um, just to, 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 to token the show out a little bit. Is that possible? It might well be. Um, but he's <sighs> so fucking good. So fucking good. Um, so I like to think that this, this show didn't do that they were looking for they've had the ancient vampire (coughs) who believes in tradition they've had spike who has some tradition but is also an anarchist and is english and then let's go for a vampire a different style of vampire so it still keeps the vampire trope fresh 
but makes them completely different with a completely different outlook. He's talking about the brothers and the this and the that. So that's that's pretty cool. So it's probably quite a smart way to do it. Um, but some shows were guilty of it. I, I don't think it's here. Hope you guys understand that sometimes I just have a thought and then I change it and complete it within voicing it, talking about the episode. So, yeah, that hopefully that all made sense. And if not, let's continue. Um, I'm just checking my notes here. Oh yeah, so Faith goes to dinner with Buffy and her mother and then... Um, Joyce is like, so how did you become the Slayer? Basically, why can't why can't Faith just take over? And Buffy says, well, you don't get a new Slayer until the other Slayer dies. Oh, when did you die? So that's <laughs> that's pretty it's pretty weird. That's that's really tough for Joyce. Sometimes Ch- Joyce gets a bad rap. Sometimes she doesn't get enough love, and uh, in this case. She's not really getting enough love because that's a big deal. I'm only on episode three and we're about an hour in. I'm going to pick this shit up, yo. I'm so slow. Only because I've got shit to do. Not to say you guys aren't top of my list. You absolutely are. But basically, I want to be a good son and meet my mother for coffee this afternoon. So, now you know. Um, Scott, <laughs> Scott Hope gives Buffy... Uh, the option of going to a Buster Keaton weekend. I don't even know what that is. Does, I've never, I'm not, don't even, I don't know. I thought I would know. Um, 20 years on, I still don't know. Um, so maybe you people know. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, he's pretty weird and he randomly gives Buffy a clatter ring, which makes her freak out, obviously. And why would you still be interested in her? She must be terribly beautiful at the school. To still be interested in her really weird behaviour and the fact that she beats other jocks and men up. Like, what's Scott got going on that makes him attracted to Buffy? I mean, obviously she's, a, she's, she's, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't know her. She's very pretty. But that's weird, right? Anyway, um, Giles asked Buffy about how Angel dies. He's looking to do a binding spell. Now, binding spell. Just to make sure a Catholic doesn't uh, open up and suck everyone into hell again and all this type of stuff. And, and Buffy avoids it, avoids it, avoids it, avoids it, and just says, you know, angel bad, stab him with the, the sword, dead. That's it. Then she finally says that angel was cured and I had to kill him. And Willow's like, oh, the spell did work. Which would spur her on to do more magic. And also, oh, so the man you loved came back. Because at different points, some people distinguish Angel to be different from Angelus. It depends what you prescribe to. And I think that's probably about right. I think he is two different people. But also, it's easy to, to argue that he's not. So, for all intents and purposes, Angelus and Angel are two different characters within the show. And then Angel returns and she's got to kill the man she loves from the point of the last time she saw him they just slept together and they were so in love so this is terribly terribly heartbreaking hugely so and i mean you could you imagine that because you're going to compartmentalize all the things that he did as angelus as the cutoff point was the night they slept together and she woke up and things were different you could almost make an argument for Maybe that was an alternate universe and then they could have filmed Buffy going back from there and he never turned. And maybe that was, you know, some alternate dimension that happened to Buffy and she's been in a coma for six months as they tried to do in one of the later episodes. It's a different take on it because it still says that demons and monsters and the Slayers are real, but that would be an easy one to because that's such a big tonal shift. So that's how it is in her head. Like, is any of that even real and then now he's back how would you do that <sighs> i don't know if i could have could you so the, the gang get clued into this and then she leaves and willow says i can help with the binding spell and giles tells her that there is no spell and he knew he knew that buffy needed that release and he would have known that they all attacked her verbally at the party and He's trying to give her 
the ability to move on and deal with it. By vocalising things, sometimes you actually get to deal with it. So, there we go. Um, at the end of this episode, Buffy places the cladder ring on the floor in the mansion where Angel disappeared. And the scene fades to black. And then very quickly, the scene illuminates, focusing on the ring, and naked, wet Angel, with no injuries, but very wet, very naked, falls from the sky and smacks into the floor, and he's back. And I remember thinking, fuck, he's back, fuck. Because I thought he was just going to be, this is a time we didn't have the internet, folks. And I didn't, you didn't, I didn't like buy the, like, I don't know, Empire or whatever magazine and read the spoilers. I didn't want to know. I, you didn't check it on the internet. There wasn't the temptation there all the time. So, like when things like this happens, you're like, holy shit, he's back! Like he didn't even know that he was still part of the show. You know, like he made a couple of cameos and dream sequences. But I thought maybe they do that, and maybe that's now the thing. Maybe he appears in her dream sequences for a period of time, and then she says, "Listen, I don't need you anymore," and then he moves on. You know, and because her dreams are kind of premonitions, you had all these options of it, whether <clears throat> that was the real angel speaking to her, or whether it's just a straight-up straight up dream. You know how you have dreams about people and whatever. So, it's um, <clears throat> it was more of a shock. It was definitely a shock, because you didn't even know he was part of the cast. Nowadays, if I was watching Buffy, I would know he was part of the cast, and he's going to reprise his role, and then move off into a spin-off. Like, you'd know this already. We didn't know this at the time. So, it was pretty shocking. Anyway, pretty cool episode. A lot of cool stuff coming in. Faith looks really, really young in this. Um, Kakisto's kind of a cool-looking demon. Mr. Trick, even cooler. Excuse me. And then we move on to Beauty and the Beast. So, in this one, Oz escapes his cage, allegedly, at night, because uh, Xander falls asleep, which kind of shows the... Maturity level, but also the level of regard that Xander has for for Oz, because he wouldn't have fallen asleep if it was Buffy or Willow. Or at least he would have he would have tried to stay awake. He just came in and went straight to sleep. And it, someone gets mauled, and everyone suspects that it's Oz. But um, Buffy then worries that it's Angel because she knows she is bumping into Angel while she's hunting, and he's basically a feral monster, and she chains him up to the mansion. I mean, I don't know who paid for this mansion or cleans the mansion or whatever, but it's pretty sweet to be able to just use that mansion whenever you want. Well, anyway. So, um, this episode introduces a couple of characters, Pete and Debbie, who are friends of Scott Hope, and Scott and uh, Buffy are now dating. Um, and basically, this is the Jekyll and Hyde episode Pete is drinking some serum to make him more manly, and he ends up he beats on Debbie. Um, they kind of wonder who the monster is. He, Oz and Debbie are kind of pally, and then Pete goes after Oz with his mutant power, and then the moon obviously comes up and Oz kicks his ass. Pete runs away. <laughs> Buffy fights him. Pete kills Debbie in the process. Angel kills Pete. And then cowers to Buffy. And also along the way, there's a therapist who Pete kills. And a couple of other things. Excuse me for about one second. Okay, I think that's kind of the basis of the storyline. I'm going to go into some of the bits that I found rather interesting. Um, when Buffy and Scott and... Oz and Willow and Pete and Debbie all meet and the couples are demonstrating different sort of physical traits and what I mean by that is that um, Pete and Debbie, uh, Pete's standing with his arm over the shoulder of Debbie and really kind of holding on to her and talking about how great he is and the flowers and this and that and he's demonstrating a possession of her because he's over the top of her. Um, Willow and Oz are holding hands kind of standing the same, both upright, as opposed to Pete looming over Debbie, which suggests that they are equals in the relationship. And Buffy and Scott are kind of standing sort of together, 
with not holding hands, no arms around, not really. There's, you couldn't obviously tell they were a couple straight away, so that suggests that their dynamic is undecided, and that's pretty interesting as well. So that's quite a nice little bit that I never noticed before um, until watching this episode for the, I don't know, third, fourth time. Fifth time, sixth time, I'm not sure. Next part uh, that I found very interesting is the therapist. The weird therapist who's, you know, he's a little bit odd, but I kind of like him. This is the therapist that Debbie sees that Pete kills because he's jealous. Buffy goes to see the therapist and he seems pretty good. Um, he seems really cool. He is smoking in a campus full of children, which is pretty, pretty odd for an adult to be smoking who's not a bad guy or cool, I did air quotes there, um, so I suppose it demonstrates that he's different and it's also part of the the reveal for later on when you find out that he's dead. But still, although it's kind of 90s, it's pretty pushing it for 90s, like if it was the 80s or early 90s when people smoked all the time, go back and watch Alien or Aliens, everyone's smoking constantly and that's why I've not even seen Covenant yet but Prometheus doesn't work because no one is smoking. But maybe that's because they are scientists as opposed to miners and that's like a blue-collar job to a white-collar job and there's a better understanding of health or something, some bullshit like that. But I think it's colonists and Covenant and they better be smoking their face off, otherwise it's bullshit. It doesn't make sense to be set before Alien or Aliens. But that's just my opinion. So that's kind of weird. Um... <clears throat> excuse me, there's a really funny bit when Willow shoots Giles in the ass when she's trying to shoot um, shoot um, Oz or Pete and Giles just passes out in this fantastic way, just fucking just, just collapses in this comedic fashion. It's one of the best knockouts that Giles has ever had. One of the best, absolutely. Now something I want to throw out to Pasha the Nerd again is the book reference and this one is a reference of Call of the Wild and Angel represents the dog named Bok who was a nice dog but basically got put in a bad situation hopefully I'm remembering this okay gets put in a bad situation and um, loses his um, loses his sense of self and becomes this, this monster uh, so he goes into much greater depth and if I think actually you get some of this from, from a, a book on Buffy and Angel metaphors. Well, that's annoying. Whoever's hammering there. Um, that's really, really annoying. Hopefully that won't continue. <coughs> um, so that's pretty cool. Um, that they have that, and that's the like the kind of little voiceover bit that Buffy is speaking about at the start and at the end. So, just a nice little tidbit there for y'all. Again, bit monster of the week. I don't care about Debbie and Pete too much because they're too quickly inserted. If they'd been dropped in, maybe in season two or season one, had like just just been in the background or said, hey, hey, there's Pete, there's Debbie, or maybe even. I don't know, they could have dropped in. That's why it's hard to care about people like Scott, because they go, oh, there's Scott, he's awesome. And they're like, who? Oh, right, this guy, I don't know who this guy is. So, but it's kind of the way it works sometimes. And when you're making 20-odd episodes instead of 12, you've got to, there is some filler in with some progression sometimes. <clears throat> Whereas nowadays they wouldn't have this. Unless, of course, you're writing Jessica Jones or The Iron Fist, where it's mostly just filler. But I digress. <laughs> Excuse me. Next episode is Homecoming. This one becomes rather, rather fun. Rather fun. Um, basically, you got Buffy and Cordy have a fallout because Cordy forgets to tell Buffy about um, about yearbook. And Buffy decides that she wants to become Homecoming Queen just like Cordelia. So they end up, you know, competing for people's affections and this and that and the next thing. Um this is the episode where Mr. Trick organised Slayer Fest 1998. <laughs> when he says it, <coughs> excuse me, when he says it, it's awful. Like, it's, it's a killer. Like, Slayer Fest 98. I remember when I used to look forward to 98, 99. Ugh, it's horrid, 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 horrid. Hopefully, y'all will feel just as old as me watching this. <coughs> um, 
Our, so basically, he gets these these random bounty hunters. You've got the monster, and you've got the, the tech guys with the man in the chair, and you've got the cowboy, one of the Gorch brothers who survived from the last season, um, comes back to get Buffy, and I think someone else? Is there maybe someone else in that? I can't remember now. I think I've got it in my notes. So they all go after Buffy and Cor. Well, they go after Buffy and Faith, or who they think is Faith, but it's actually Cordelia, because the the Scooby Gang, <coughs> the Scooby Gang who rent out a, a limo to all go to the homecoming dance together, decide that maybe because Buffy and Cordy had fallen out, they'll they'll ride together, and then everyone chases Mister Trick chases the 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 limo and Buffy kicks all her asses basically Cordy has a little nice bit at the end and really uh, steps up to I think the Gorch brother if I remember correctly and basically tells him to, to hit the road because she's the real tough slayer and Buffy's just like the mini baby slayer so he better watch himself um, but they, they, they defeat the bad guys, reconcile just in time to find out that neither of them won Homecoming Queen. Even though they did this nice little bit where they said, we've got joint winners for the first time ever, and it's the other two girls. Which is kind of cool. So, that's kind of the basis of the episode, of things that are going on. Mr. Trick again, just being like, just eating up screen time and being fan-bloody-tastic. Um, things that are interesting here. Buffy is insensitive to Angel talking about Scott. Yes, she is. Uh, so, yep, yeah, cool with the blood. And you're feeling better now. You're more human. Um, I've met someone. Um, I don't even like him that much yet. Um, he's pretty much new. He's only been in the show for two episodes. He's normal. Go outside. Um, he's not Xander. Um, and he's not you. So... How'd you like them apples? Pretty insensitive, if you ask me. Something else that Buffy does is not tell the others about Angel being back yet. Which you could argue is strange, because if you keep something from someone, does that not therefore mean that you know that that's wrong? Conversely, is she keeping it from them because she knows they'll try and kill him? So... I'm more on the second one, but also she probably believes she can handle it, and it won't go to where it went to again, but it obviously will. And she's using Scott, basically, which Scott senses, of course. This is the first scene with the mayor, and he's so good. Um, his, uh, what would you call him, his aide comes in and is looking suitably nervous, and the mayor is really polite, really nice, and he kind of says, did you wash your hands? He says thoroughly, like multiple times or whatever, and he's wiping stuff with baby wipes and the, the whole thing. Well, that was it, that was it. The aide hands him a piece of paper and he smells it and asks if he washes his hands. I'm not quite sure what smell you'd expect to have from someone washing their hands or not washing their hands, more to the point, and passing paper to you. But it's disgusting either way. So, um,. Yeah, this scene's totally sweet, and the fact that the mayor is really intimidating and scary without actually doing anything is really good. It's really good. It makes you think, wow, if he's this nice and polite, but this guy's this scared of him, what does this mean? <laughs> okay. So. <clears throat> Sandra and Willow. Xander and Willow. Xander and Willow is something that you thought you wanted. Xander ends up with Cordy somehow. The, the super nerd of the school ends up with the hottest girl of the school who's the most materialistic and shallow and what have you. And Willow finally gets a boy who worships the ground she walks on and demonstrates that you know he'll do things like Oh, I, I know you're trying to have sex with me and give me your virginity as a show to show me how much you care for me. But I don't think you're ready yet, so we won't do that. That's that's Willow and and and, uh, and Oz. Oz is so understanding of her and so level-headed 
and they're happy and Xander and Cordy are pretty happy. But you know that Willow is always like Xander and Xander did show that he knew that she liked him even as far back as season one. In the the pack episode and the end of season two he says that he loves her. So you think that you want this, but guess what? When it actually happens, you don't want it. You don't feel good about them two making out. Which is amazing because they're meant to be the more main characters than the other ones. But you know it's wrong and you know that actually they're happy in their relationship. It's just sometimes you're just drawn to someone and you make mistakes. I'm sure we've all been there at one point or another. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you've just been on the other side of it. But um, I just saw a name for someone that um, wrote, maybe directed Lover's Walk, Dan Weber. And I thought it said Darth Vader and I was like, what? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the reason that it doesn't work, even though they're more main characters and we should probably side with them, is that we know that they're both, they both have good things going on and, do you know what, it's a wrong time, wrong place. The thing, life is all about timing in so many ways. Sometimes, sometimes a girl comes along and she's just right for you. But you're not ready for her. And sometimes it happens a lot of times. And it could be the same for, for a girl. Maybe a girl has, goes out with a guy who's a total asshole to her. And then she is protective of, of her feelings. And the next guy who is the nice guy and the right guy for her doesn't work. And then she realises I should have given that guy a chance. And then by the time she realises that this guy's gone... She goes to the next guy, and then guess what? She, this guy she gives too much leeway to, and he turns out to be a bit more of an asshole. And therefore, you get that spiral where, you know, that thing where some people say like, "Why do go girls always go for for asshole guys?" Well, there's a few reasons why. The first one being asshole guys are usually, um, usually exhibit more of the more masculine traits in terms of. They're more sure of themselves, they will do what they want. Um, if something happens they don't like, they'll speak up. They'll be more aggressive in their approach to things. Whereas guys that may be nice guys are more timid and placid and will go, but whatever you want to do, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They won't order your drink, they won't tell you when you're being, being annoying, whatever, and then they end up not respecting them because you get these two different dynamics. So it's a very fine line to have. I think that's why women sometimes end up always, or it's why women can't end up always with a, an asshole because they're looking for a strong male archetype, but what they get is just that 10% or more over the line and end up getting someone who is overbearing, too, like not protective, but, but um, um, not manipulative. Yeah, overbearing and, you know, doesn't like you going out and, and whatever. So they go they go a little bit over past that to find um, the, the stronger male character. Whereas they go for the nice guy and then he kind of, he's too placid for them. So that's why girls can end up, I'm sure some of the guys out there are thinking, well, I'm a nice guy, why do, why do I always get friend zone? Well, it's because you've not got enough cojones. So you want to have enough cojones to be macho. But you also got to be tender. And that's where that fine line comes in. And I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this now. But I have no idea. Interesting. Anyway. <clears throat> anyway, anyway, anyway. I suppose... <sighs> no, I have no idea where I am. Um, Xander and Willow... They make out because of the they, they blame they blame the nice the nice costumes that they're wearing the nice suits that they're wearing the nice dresses they're wearing um, and then they're super guilty throughout and their awkwardness is kind of cool but then they continue on making out throughout the next episodes which is kind of shit for Cordy and Oz um, in this episode kind of the, the, the deal of it is is that Buffy generally feels isolated. Um, and she wants a little bit of recognition because, but her, her secret identity won't allow her to get the recognition. So she wants to get recognition via winning the prom. And everyone wants recognition for their work. I mean, 
someone says to you, oh, you didn't do your paper, you're such a fucking bum, Buffy, you're so lazy. It's like, I was busy saving the world and I've not slept more than three hours a night for the last two years. Fuck you. Like, just even think about that for a second here. Imagine patrolling every night and then trying to go to school the next day and deal with this shit. I mean, it's not like it just happens conveniently at the weekend. Imagine how, you know, messed up your life gets if, like, or how tired you are if you get if you don't get a good night's sleep for, like, the best part of a week. That's Buffy's life. I and mean, okay, so she's got superpowers, so she probably doesn't need to have that much sleep. She's probably a bit Margaret Thatcher that way. But still, it's pretty shit. I'm trying to think what I should do here. Shall I go and make this, make three episodes of this? Or shall I do one more? Where are we at? We're at Bad Candy. That'd be the sixth episode. <sighs> right, I know where we're going to take it to. I know we're going to take it to. I know now. I don't always know until I do it, and then we know. So, Homecoming is a, is a really fun episode and feels very... It just feel, feels very season three-ish, and that's something I forgot to mention, is that season the season's kind of... Season one ends, and then season one... Season two begins with lots of season one things being tied up, because what this what Buffy does, and Angel does it as well, is that you don't just tie up the season and then move on to the next thing. You the characters still need to deal with what was the what happened at the end of that season. We need to deal with it, and that's what makes it different. So that's why it takes three, four, five, six episodes to deal with these issues. So Buffy is dealing with the issues of <clears throat> Angel killing her lover, um, being alone, no one understanding her her pain, no one understanding the level of responsibility that she has, um. Whereas in season two, at the start of it, she had to deal with the fact that she died, that she, that the, the master had, in effect, killed her, that the anointed one was still coming after them in various ways. How would you kill a child who is a vampire? They never, I mean, that was lucky that Spike did that because, yeah, you know, they made it, well, it was actually kind of funny, but it would have been tough to watch Buffy stake the wee boy. It would have been really hard to do. I think they could have probably done it, but it would have been tough to get to. So what usually happens with Buffy is that they deal with they deal with the ramifications of the previous season at the start of the second season. This is really starting to kick off into season three now. It feels more and more like season three. Like Faith is taking over from Kendra, you know. So, and then we get kind of a fun, more fun episode in this one where we have Ethan Rain coming back um, at the behest of Mr. Trick and providing all Sunnydale with um, this candy that basically de-ages you, makes you act like teenagers, although there would be an argument to say that only Giles and Joyce act like teenagers and everyone else just seems to act like an idiot or drunk or... I mean, <sighs> Snyder acts like a teenager as well, but the rest of the characters all just act obnoxious and drunk, which I don't know if you've ever attended bar, especially in a I mean, these are all stuffy adults. Um, the way adults are promote, uh, usually shown in this show is that adults are very stuffy and proper and you know, 9 to 5 and white collar and such. Apart from Sanders' family. So if you've ever dealt with white collar people drunk and acting obnoxious, <clears throat> you'll know what a chore it is. Anyway... <clears throat> don't know if you hear this knocking, it might come out in post completely, but I certainly hear it, it's kind of weird. Um, this one is, oh this is very, very, very annoying. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so this is a fantastic episode in terms of comedy because Giles becomes like basically punk Giles, it's sort of like how you'd imagine Spike to be if he stayed in the 80s or the 70s, um, and Joyce becomes like this loved up, like hippie chick, so they're both kind of free spirits, a little bit different, and they both ended up conforming as uh, people tend to do, you know, um, quite often people people who are free spirits like that, and maybe the, the punk scene and the hippie scene, punk scene in the, the UK and hippie scene in America in the 70s, are kind of <coughs> counter counterculture at the time, which is sort of what Buffy and the rest of the team are. They're more on the slightly alternative side of things, as opposed to they're not just the normal high school kids. So that they're 
parental figures of the show, which is Joyce and, and Giles, represent that as well. That they were both once um, more outsiders, probably compared to the normal conventions of their, who their friends would have been, and yet they still conformed. So that's an interesting point to make. Um, we also find out in this episode that the mayor owes a, one of the demons underneath the city a debt which is kind of cool, we'll get to that in a second but um, basically it becomes a Buffy realises I'm sorry, I mean started because there's lots of sirens going you guys won't hear this, but there's a lot of sirens going so there must be some big trouble in town, I do wonder but not enough to stop podcasting um, <clears throat> yeah basically the whole gang think, what is going on with all the adults here? When they go to the Bronx, they find all the adults are like falling about and being idiots and whatever. And yeah, it's because the, the excuse me, the candy. And um, <clears throat> Slender tags along with them for the ride, which is hilarious. Very, very funny. Very funny. And <clears throat> what's his name? Ar- his name is Armin Shimmerman. <clears throat> he is so good. So good at this. I mean, I know him as Quark, so when he appeared in this, I was like, oh, it's Quark from Deep Space Nine. He does look really weird in real life, but he's so good. That voice is iconic to me on so many levels. And um, I, I love every scene he's in. He has that character down just perfectly. And, like You're meant to hate him, but I actually, I actually kind of love him a little bit. He's better than Principal Flutie, anyway. And he's... I'd always been wondered... I've always wondered... I'd be interested to know what his backstory was like. Was he, was he like a troubleshooting principal? Is that what his job was? That kind of seems to be what it would be because he knows about the special circumstances of Sunnydale. So it'd be kind of cool to find out, you know, maybe that he was. I don't know. He'd worked with problem schools before, and maybe he mentions that, but I don't think he does. But it'd be cool if they had like a little thing to suggest that he did work with problem schools, but became disenfranchised and whatever what made him be that jaded person when he speaks to Giles in in the the puppet show episode in season one when he says you know don't you just hate teenagers and Giles is like um you're in the wrong profession so anyway he's just he's really fun in this and he's kind of like he was also a small wee guy at school and you know he, he didn't he wasn't he wasn't cool, he didn't have loads of friends, and he's like, are you guys ditching me? Don't ditch me. And they're like, no, no, Snyder, come along. And he just kind of runs along, and he plays it so, so well. Um, I really like the fact that Ethan Rain is back, because Ethan is really good fun and a really good actor. Um, he manages, he's he's also prim and proper like Giles, but in a different way. He's got a lot of charisma, um, and obviously he knows all about the, the Ripper, the Ripper side of Giles, and I've just realised that because I've been watching some reviews of season two again as well. In between, when I watch the season three ones, I take notes, and when I sometimes I just want to watch something for fun, I've been watching season one from the beginning. In terms of watching reviews, so I think I might have said that we discovered Giles Ripper past, but we already we already know about his Ripper past um, from season two. So I think I made a mistake there, and I'm just correcting myself. Um. <clears throat> yes, okay, right, fine. I just had to look at my notes there for a second. This, uh, So this episode, Buffy finds the, the source of the problem, which would be Ethan Rain, and he also finds Giles and Joyce there, and they end up having sex on the hood of a car, police car, twice after Giles decks a police officer and steals his gun, which is just... just It, it shows you how dangerous and much of a badass Giles is, and maybe he's stuffy and out of shape now, but he was battle tested, so it lends itself to the that he could be he could go back to that and become more dangerous and formidable as the show goes on. So from here on, he becomes more of a tough character as opposed to the a, a wet noodle, which he he had been originally. He'd get knocked out. Excuse me, he still gets knocked out a whole bunch, don't get me wrong, but it's like he'd spent too much time in the library and lost his um he'd lost the dragon, you know what I'm saying? And then he, he you see this, and you're, it makes it more believable that he can become battle hardened, um, and he can, har- he can he can go back to his past, previous self when he was a bit of a badass, and use that. And it also helps for things that happen in other seasons, like season five. 
So um, they go they go trying to figure out what the, the deal is with the candy and it leads them downstairs into the sewers where the mayor was using the candy to distract all the adults and to steal children, babies, that could be sacrificed to this demon, otherwise known as the CGI snake. And luckily, the mayor, when he is down there in the, in the sewer, which is kind of an odd place for him to be, he, he sneaks out the back and Buffy fights Mr. Trick and then has to kill the giant snake demon. Now, Giles jumps in to help her in his very punk way and Mr. Trick throws him in front of the snake demon and that involves Buffy getting, you know, sometimes people try to help Buffy and they probably shouldn't have. You know, did they help her because they, they, they sought to help her or did they help her because she needed because they felt they had to do something for their own personal reasons. Interesting. I think a bit of both. I think a bit of both. The male ego might have came into pl- uh, into play here. Um. So yeah, we killed the CGI demon, which I would rather they used. Um, I would rather they use practical. At least it would look more like the rest of the stuff in the show up to this point. This is when they start using CGI in 1998 and sometimes I, it doesn't really work for me. Um, sometimes it does uh, I think later on. Some of the stuff is, is okay but this isn't this isn't good CGI. It's it's late 90s CGI. It's bad. It's really bad. I would rather they used a practical giant snake or something else. It could have been another reptile boy. That would make sense. Anyway um Everyone gets their kind of. Everyone goes back to how they were, and Giles and Joyce act kind of weird from here on in for a period of time until we get the reveal later on. So that's quite fun, and basically the episode is maybe suggesting. Oh, I just realized. I just I just saw a note there saying that Joyce has great legs in this. Joyce looks really hot in this. Um, I always thought so, and now she. I used to think she looked hot for an older woman, and now she's just hot. So. Bada bing, bada boom, how things change. Um, the, the show suggests that all things go towards chaos. And that... Uh, or in some ways it does. Um, Buffy seeking out Angel and seeking comfort in him and c- confiding in him, uh, even though she knows that what will happen is they will eventually start to fall in love again and from there on that can only end in one of two ways they either break up horribly or they go towards the pain and and I'm sure we've all been in a relationship where maybe you break up and you get back together and it, 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 you're sad and you get back together and it starts to work you're like okay we won't make the, we won't make the same mistakes of the past let's keep going with this and then suddenly old problems arise you make the same mistakes, you fall into old patterns, you fall out, it's horrible, you break up, and maybe even do it all again. And that's what Buffy is kind of going towards, and that's what Ethan Rain represents. He represents uh, something. Excuse me, I just need to blow my nose again. Ethan Rain represents entropy. And that basically means everything descends towards chaos. I just like to check that there after I blew my nose. Because sometimes I don't spell things correctly. Well, I do, but sometimes it's... No, I don't. But sometimes it does change it on the, on the phone when you do the swipe function or whatever. I just want to make sure that the right word... That word was the right word. Um, also, other things that happen in this episode is that if you shock your responsibilities, as the parents, the grown-ups have, then the terrible thing that would happen would be the kids would have died. So that's another example of it right there, um, of things descending towards chaos because you do not... um, There's a lack of order, which means that if there's a lack of order, things start to decline, which is why great love affairs only ever last so long and things go so bad. I mean, the story of Romeo and Juliet could be considered to be a story of entropy. (coughs) So... Um, another note I've written here is that Xander and Willow fool around a lot um, in this episode and kind of think that's just harmless fun, but 
if you do it once, you're going to probably do it again. And doing it more times makes it only more familiar. Then you fall into a habit while yearning for it. And then it becomes a habit. And then suddenly, as we find out later on, people find out and um, people get hurt. Um, so, <clears throat> in terms of this episode is really about responsibility, I suppose more than entropy. And your lack of responsibility shows that things decline into chaos, so then it becomes about entropy and becomes very messy. And I suppose, um, because Buffy always suggests that she wishes she didn't have this burden placed upon her, which most teenagers will feel like most of the time, like, why do I have to do this? Why have I got these burdens? Why have I got to get up to go to school? Why have I got to go get a job? Why do I need to get these grades? Um, I just want to chill out and have fun with my friends. I, you know, well, you, you can't do that because um, people have responsibilities as well. And, and realistically, at the end of the day, you need need money to pay bills and such like and whatever. So Buffy longs for a, for a lack of responsibility in the episode, and then when the adults have no responsibility, the place descends into chaos. And she realises that we need responsibility, we need order, and we need a direction, and we need, to some um, to some extent, control. Which you can suggest that the government controls us. And, and there is some talk about, you know, the government... Maybe the government shouldn't have the sort of level of control that they have. Maybe we shouldn't have any government. People should just manage themselves. Well, what happens then? Well, the world would descend into chaos, and it certainly would. So, yes, well, there is corruption right now. Um, and there always will be with anyone who's in power. Um, if there was no police, if there was no ambulance service, and fire service or whatever, we would descend into the basis levels of ourselves looking only for pleasure and personal gain, presumably. So, however, as much as the adults, it was a comedy episode, they could have turned into, they could have been raping, pillaging, stealing, and killing and a whole bunch of stuff it basically it could have been like the purge and that's what things would be like if we didn't have laws and people to enforce them so as much as i think that the government is corrupt and they lie to us and they cause false flags and this and that i also think the we it is necessary that most people need to be governed in some sort of way um how many of you work for someone and, if you could get away with it, would shirk your job or your responsibilities? Conversely, how many people who listen to the show work for themselves, like me, and I know if I don't get shit done, I don't get paid. I can't pay my bills, I can't feed myself, I can't get anything done. So sometimes I might have no clients scheduled for a day and... I've got a whole bunch of things I can do on the computer, updating things and uploading and whatever, and social media and making plans, nutrition plans, training programs, whatever. I could just not do any of that and just like watch movies all day uh, or play computer games or whatever. But I know there's certain things that need to happen so that my life can function in a very responsible sense and therefore I can have downtime and be potentially irresponsible in some areas. So that's what's kind of interesting about this episode, how much the place descends into chaos. And they make it comedic, but they could have made it very, very, very dark. Anyway, <clears throat> so we've went, went an hour and a half, folks. And as much as I love talking to you, my, my throat is very sore. Um, I feel like I'm flagging a little bit. Um, I wanted to try and do this uh, season in two parts. I think it's going to turn into three. I'm not quite sure how that's happened, because I don't know. Because I managed to do season two in two parts. Although I think I went longer. I think this one's going to turn into three or either a very, very long... Um, excuse me, the next episode is going to be very long. Um, gone up to... Just give me a second to find it. We've gone up to Van Candy, so we're six episodes in. The next episode here, Revelations, one of my favourites. And then Lover's Walk is also good fun. Um, then we come to one of my favourite episodes of the entire show in The Wish, um, which is fantastic. 
Amends is really, really good. Gingerbread I don't like so much. Helpless coming soon. I'm just try to jog your memory, which is one I don't like that I don't like as much as other ones, but and same with Zeppo, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in it, and then we get bad girls, and it just gets really fucking good from there. So my plan, there's some real good stuff here. I think I'm gonna take us up to bad girls next, and then we'll or maybe a little bit further, and then we'll do bad girls, which is basically when some tonal changes happen within one of the main characters, and then we'll do bad girls all the way to the end. That's my plan, and I hope to get these out over the next week, um, just to just to kind of drip feed you all. Uh, it's all it's basically dependent on quietness, but that's my plan to do that, and then we'll be on to season four, um, which will be very exciting. And I'm actually going to be doing that more in real time as opposed to looking back, so. That's different to the ways I've been doing it. I've went backward and, and, and talked about it um, after I've watched it all. I had it maybe even been on the next season, but this time I'm going to stop at a point and then talk about those shows while they're really fresh. Um, for me, it'll be interesting to see if that changes things. It'll be interesting to see if you guys notice a difference. But as always, I would be welcome to your feedback. Um, I always want to know what you think, and I want to thank people who do uh, provide feedback so far. Uh, I think that, like I said, one day when I go down, I'll, one day I'll do each episode and break it down and maybe make some cool ass videos. Um, if you've forgotten to take a note, um, the the person who I've really enjoyed watching recently, who've got who has got some good companion episodes, and I think I'd really be interested to know how it feels to watch their. 10 minute videos on each episode and then listening to my long form podcast um, how you feel about that and if it actually works and if it does let, let myself and this person know and this guy is the passion of the nerd he does some really nice videos so I'd follow him on YouTube and um, you could also follow us on YouTube um, at the Buff Geek Podcast Show <coughs> excuse me um, actually is that the name of it I'm not very good with the names of stuff I've never been very good. Yes, the, the Buff Geek Podcast Show. So check that out. That's got all the episodes on it um, of the podcast. It also has a couple of exclusives, which are little videos that I've made. I'm wanting to make more videos, but they only really take a lot of time, but I will get to them. Um, check us out at the website, which is thebuffgeekpodcastblog.wordpress.com. We also have the Twitter, which is at the Buff Geek, um, and basically everything else, social media, just check out the Buff Geek. I want to thank our sponsors at Alpha Fitness. I am really flagging now. I am sorry, <clears throat> um, but hopefully you understand. I, I want to get this out to you, and um, I know you've been waiting on some content, so I thought I'd give it a bash. Hopefully I don't sound too bad. Um, I'm doing it for my love of you guys and the love of Buffy. Come back real soon. Much love. Hashtag the Buff Geek Podcast. Right, well, disregarding my youth and beauty, let's move on.